My name is Benjamin Trump. I'm a product manager on the Daydream team, focused specifically on uh, using immersive uh, technology like VR and AR to make learning and teaching better. Uh, and I'm joined by two members of our team here, uh, Jen, who's our program manager, fresh from the Daydream keynote just now, uh, and Brandon, who leads our engineering team. So we're going to share some updates on expeditions with you today, uh, show you what we've been up to lately, uh, and then show you how it's possible to make your own learning application with VR or AR, uh, and then offer some thoughts about why you should do that. Now, I'd wager if you ask most people to like, list the things they think VR would be good for, uh, most people would actually uh, put education sort of at the top of that list. We talk about it sort of like it seems obvious, and it is pretty obvious. It's like the first thing we did with it uh, here at Google. But it's not just because VR is fun or because it makes you feel like you're somewhere else that it's an obvious fit for learning. At least within our team, it's because it powerfully supports like, what our values are as people who are trying to uh, like, enable better learning with technology. And what are those values? Well, for us, we think that good learning experiences should be fundamentally immersive, interactive, and social. And we act, it's like no surprise that we actually believe those same things uh, are the ones that characterize good VR experiences. We think they should be immersive, right? Because being engaged, interested, like emotionally invested, like these are really important contexts in which to learn. Uh, and that when things are immersive, they're less abstract. There's sort of less cognitive load to process. Uh, we also think that they need to be interactive because it's empowering to have agency as a user, to not feel constrained, to be able to have a thought and see a result, uh, to be able to dig in deeper when you see something that like, picks your interest. And they're social because when people come together as a group with diverse viewpoints that they discuss and synthesize, uh, then you know, we, we learn from one another, uh, and we end up with a sum that's greater than the parts. And this is important to us at Google because we aren't interested in just creating future graduates. We want to create future creators, inventors, problem solvers, dreamers. So that's why we started Expeditions. We wanted to give schools a simple, approachable, and immediately useful tool for using VR in the classroom and creating more of those sorts of experiences on a more regular basis. And here to talk to you a little bit more about it is Jen. Thanks, Ben. So Expeditions uh, was announced two years ago, uh, and it was our first large-scale effort to bring VR in the classroom. And all schools needed was a simple smartphone or a tablet and a VR viewer, and they could be teleported all over the world, uh, underwater and even to Mars. And on our team, you know, many of the same people that built Classroom and G Suite for Education are the same people that built Expeditions, and we were able to rely really heavily on those insights uh, that we acquired. And one of the most important things that we learned is that you really need to embrace the key functions of a classroom. That students engaging, interacting, learning with each other as well as their peers. But there are also a couple other things that are actually really critical. One is it needs to be so easy to use. You can't rely on teachers to go to professional development training to get trained on your tool. Two, you need to really make that immersion, that uh, social connection between teachers and students and students and students, and make, making sure that it's engaging and interacting. And you need to make sure that your product works on, a multiple, on multiple devices and platforms. And that's really important because schools have a variety of devices, and they have a variety of platforms, and they're not just going to pick one. And you can't expect teachers to replace their materials overnight. And so you need to make sure that your tool or your product can easily fit uh, into the existing curriculum. And that's what we did with Expeditions. And just like Chromebooks, we imagined that the expedition kits would be a shared resource between classes uh, and, and schools. And one of, the most, uh, one of the biggest things we realized was that most teachers weren't actually aware of VR when we first started this. And so what we decided to do was bring expeditions to schools through the Expeditions Pioneer program. And you know, what we saw was that once teachers got a chance to see VR in action and see how expeditions could transform their classroom, they were immediately hooked. And so the first year, we took expeditions to over a million students in 11 countries. 
and we got incredible feedback, particularly from teachers in the UK. So this past year, we actually went back to the UK, and we just wrapped up our program there, and we took another million students um, in the UK on an expedition. And that's one in about every eight primary and secondary students in all of the UK. So that brings our total number of students that have gone on and used expeditions to over two million in the last two years. And even after expeditions has been used for weeks or months or years, we still get the same teacher feedback like this each and every day. And so it's not just the novelty of VR. Clearly, something is working in the classroom. And even more importantly, we've heard from thousands of students from around the world who have sent us personal letters. And actually, these are just the ones we got last week, so you can see. And I want to share one of them with you, because it's, it's really too precious not to share. So this is from Lozen. He's a student in the UK, and he, sends, he sent us this letter. He said, the whole experience has made me even more keen to become a doctor and study the human body thoroughly. The technology I used helped me understand such complex subjects easily. The solar system trip was incredibly fascinating. I did not feel myself sitting in class. Instead, I felt like Tim Peek orbiting the solar system. Now, I'm not sure whether I should be a doctor or an astronaut. I'm quite confused at this moment. My mom says I should watch more of these Google expeditions before I make up my mind. And for once, I think I'll listen to her. <laughs> and yes, Lozen, we agree with your mom. You should probably go on more Google expeditions. So things are clearly working, and there's a quite a bit of momentum that's actually happening in the ecosystem. We're seeing hundreds of partners create expeditions, everything from traditional education partners like HMH to non-traditional partners. And we're working with museums and cultural institutions to create these expeditions. And we have a growing library of over 600 tours. We've also worked with many hardware partners to create certified expedition kits. So that's all the hardware that a class of 30 would actually need to take an expedition. And Best Buy Education was one of our first partners uh, that we worked with last year to launch uh, an expeditions kit. And we've now worked with several other partners around the globe to ensure that schools actually have certified uh, kits to use. We've also worked really closely with teachers to create supporting lesson plans, which is really important, because as I mentioned earlier, the lessons need to be incorporated into the actual curriculum so that teachers can use it seamlessly. And so we partnered with Tez to upload these lessons. And Tez is a global platform. It has over 8 million teachers that are sharing and learning uh, with each other and, and, and their lesson materials. And what's really cool is that we're also seeing expeditions used outside of the classroom. And that's something that we didn't initially anticipate. We're seeing government organizations, we're seeing nonprofits, and we're seeing businesses start to use expeditions. So let's just take a look at one example. And what you see on the screen is actually our coral bleaching expedition. So it's basically highlighting the coral bleaching event that took place in 2014. And Michael, who is a sixth grade earth science teacher in New York, uh, sorry, in New Jersey, used this expedition to explain the impact that climate change was happening uh, you know, to his students. And this, they were able to go underwater and actually see the coral bleaching event. And when talking to Michael about the experience, he highlighted that expedition continues to add another layer of authenticity to the learning in the classroom by using it effectively and seamlessly and integrating it into the curriculum. And what amazed me, though, about this expedition in particular was that it was used at COP21, which was the UN, uh, it, which happened in Paris, and it was the UN Climate Change Conference. And I was actually fortunate enough to attend. And it was a presentation with about 150 different scientists, and it was a big panel. You know, and what was a one-way dialogue between the panel and the audience became really lively when a scientist actually took an expeditions kit and started passing it out to the audience everyone started going on this expedition together and actually could observe the big coral bleaching event that happened in Hawaii in 2014. And the whole room was transformed instantly. So we're seeing some of these examples occur rather frequently. 
And it's really exciting for us to see not only how Expeditions is used in the classroom, but how it's used outside of the classroom uh, over the past two years. So what's next with Expeditions? One of the most important things that we value as an education product team is listening to teachers and students. We take feedback really seriously, and we actually read every single piece of feedback that we receive. And I kid you not, because my team is the one that does it. So we're actually working to address some of the top feature requests that we've gotten from teachers and students, and uh, we're going to take a look at a sneak peek. So with over 600 tours available, we know it can be a bit challenging for teachers to actually find the expeditions that we're looking for. So rolling out soon, you'll see a new UI uh, in the Expeditions app that'll allow you to see a set of featured expeditions. You'll be able to search by specific categories. Uh, and we've also improved the search, so it'll make browsing a lot easier to find the expeditions that you want. And the other really important thing is that the UI is really responsive, and it works on a tablet or a phone. So we know if you're in magic window mode or full screen mode with a tablet, it'll work great. Or if you're on your mobile device, it'll work fine. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Ben. Thanks, Jen. Uh, we've also heard from teachers that they want more tools uh, to explain and highlight the things within expedition scenes uh, and environments. So uh, we'll be bringing uh, this new sort of annotations tool uh, that lets you draw right on top of expeditions. And we think it's going to be really, really useful. If you think sort of the number of times when you're watching a sports commentator use a telestrator to like illustrate a particularly interesting play in a game, um, it's exactly the same thing here. And the way this works is a guide can draw something on the scene with their finger or a stylus, uh, like here, sort of pointing out uh, a new, where like a new set of solar panels might go. And then each of the connected explorers, whoop, sorry, uh, they see that same thing uh, reflected on theirs as well. There you go. It's really cool. OK. Um, and now for the number one uh, most requested feature of all, the ability to explore on your own. Now, we see firsthand each day how powerful a teaching tool expeditions can be when used in a classroom of 30 students. But we also acknowledge that as much learning happens outside the classroom as happens within it. You don't always find yourself with like a willing and able teacher like right there in the room with you. So we'll soon be making expeditions available in a solo mode that lets you experience them uh, without a live guide present. We've built out a full VR UI within expeditions that lets you do everything right there, like searching and discovering awesome expeditions content all in VR. And when you found the expeditions you like, you can dive right in, step through the scenes and sites uh, within that expedition at your own pace. You can learn more by bringing up this info panel with relevant facts and details. Uh, and just so you don't feel like when you're alone in VR, we've added support for narrations to accompany you as well. View of the spot where Hamilton fell. This 1830 view of the dueling grounds in Weehawken, New Jersey, shows a memorial to Hamilton with Manhattan in the background. After being shot by Burr, Hamilton was rowed back across the river to Manhattan by friends. According to a report... So that just gives you a little taste. But we've already had some really, really amazing folks provide narrations. Uh, and I'll, again, pass it back to Jen to tell you about that. Does anyone recognize the voice? I heard Hamilton. It was Lin-Manuel Miranda, who is the American actor and playwright. You know, he wrote Hamilton, also starred in it. Um, and so some of the new tours that will actually be coming out uh, as part of solo mode will be a couple of Hamilton tours. And it'll be about Hamilton's life and the place where he dueled with Burr. Uh, and just for the record, uh, these expeditions won't actually save you any money on a Broadway ticket. <laughs> And we've also partnered with Major League Baseball. Um, and so we've created five new tours, uh, narrated tours with them. And so you can step up to home plate at Camden Yards or City Fields. You can learn more about uh, MLB StatCast. And you can learn about the career of a baseball beat reporter. And all of these new expeditions uh, will also be available to schools through the live guided mode. Uh, and we've also had several teachers who've already created lessons to correspond with these specific expeditions, which make it really easy for them to incorporate. And those are also on TES. So solo mode will work in, on Cardboard. Uh, and it'll work on Android and iOS. And we're also really excited that expeditions will be coming soon to Daydream. 
devices so that ex you can explore uh, expeditions on your own or with a live guide. We are doing demos of uh, solo mode uh, in the Daydream tent just right next door. So go check it out in the sandbox. So uh, VR is uh, amazing at making you feel like you're somewhere else, like you've been transported to a new place. Uh, but we've also heard from many students and teachers that they want to interact more with things or objects that you might find in those places. And it was actually one of the first things that struck us uh, when watching Expeditions VR used in the classroom. It was sort of the fact that things in VR scenes had a physical placement. Uh, and that actually changed the way that students were called and talked about them. Like a student that would like, see a, an expedition about a shark, they actually point to like, the place in the scene where they saw that shark. It became like a fixed in their spatial memory, not in this like, sort of textbook uh, on a desk. And there may like, very well be something else going on here. Uh, there's this idea that's really popular in cognitive science circles right now called embodied cognition. And basically, that theory is that our bodies play like, a much bigger role in how we think, learn, and remember uh, than we've generally thought in the past. So the theory is that when we move around and look around and see things presented in AR or VR, that can tap into some very powerful capabilities of our bodies plus our minds. So Tango is the technology that allows us to do that with AR. And we've combined the live, social, sort of teacher-curated capabilities of Google Expeditions with the power of Tango to augment the environment with virtual objects and animations. Tango uses sophisticated computer vision combined with some simple sensors and a smartphone, very much like the ones that you all have in your pockets right now, uh, to sense the depth and dimensions of the environment uh, that you hold that phone up to. So like, what does this sort of mean in practice in terms of how a teacher would do it? Well, it makes it possible for a teacher to sort of digitally map their classroom and place digital objects in them as if they existed in that space for real. And because Tango creates that canonical sort of digital map, the objects placed within this space are persistent across sessions, can be shared with other devices, and allow for students and teachers to sort of share a common view of that. And that's one of the key things that makes Tango a unique and really, really powerful thing in the classroom. AR isn't new in the classroom. There's lots of actually really awesome uh, learning applications that use device cameras on a tablet um, to do pass-through in order to show digital objects. But those cameras see the world as a flat 2D environment. And they can't create that sort of shared social experience where a classroom can collectively stand in front of an object and talk about it like it was right there in the room. And we've also given teachers similar controls that they have to uh, those in Expeditions VR, allowing them to point things out, change the object, and control the pace of the class. And it's been really fun to sort of grant teachers this new superpower to magically go deeper uh, into any subject in the classroom. And instead of, or maybe like more importantly, in addition to the traditional content used in schools, AR can place inaccessible things right in front of the student. So we've seen it in, uh, encourage more curiosity, engender more questions and conversation uh, among teachers and students. And we think it can serve as a really, really powerful complement to VR experiences as well. So VR takes you like anywhere in the world, and AR brings anything in the world to you. So let's take a look at how AR is being used in the classroom. Let's just uh, watch this quick video. It's the same one we showed at the keynote, but we love it. All right, who wants to see a volcano? Three, two, one. Wow! Look at that lava. Look at that smoke coming out of that. Pretend you're an airplane and fly over the tornado. That's the top of it. What do you see? It's either asteroid, meteorite. We're learning about DNA and genes, things that we can't see. And so the most exciting thing for me with the AR technology was that I could see kids get an aha moment that I couldn't get by just telling them about it. The minute I saw it pop up on the screen, it made me want to get up and walk to it. We actually get to turn around and look at things from all angles. So it gave us a nice perspective. See if you can figure out what that might be based on what you know about the respiratory system. I got to see where the alveoli branched off and I could look inside them and see how everything worked, which I never saw before, and it was really, really cool. So that video is actually from a couple of our pilot schools uh, that have been using 
AR in their classroom, and we've been piloting with a number of schools all over the world. And the feedback has been incredibly positive. And we've learned a great deal um, and really seen some amazing creative ways that teachers have incorporated AR into the classroom, similarly how we saw Expeditions VR incorporated into the classroom. And so here's just one example um, from our pilot, which I just love. How many of you remember taking a math field trip? Oh, we have one per two. OK, you took a math. Most of us don't get to go on field trips in math class, right? And yet, learning about math in the context of the actual real world is really powerful. And so that's what we actually saw with a middle school class in New York who used Expeditions AR. Uh, and they create, the teacher, we worked with the teacher to create this mini golf lesson to calculate how golf balls form different angles as they hit the obstacle. So throughout the room was this amazing mini golf course in the classroom, and the students could see the different holes and how the different angles changed when the ball hit specific obstacles. And just like we did with Expeditions VR, we'll be bringing Expeditions AR to schools this fall through the Pioneer program. We want to give teachers the ability to see how this technology can be interactive, engaging, and fun with their students. Uh, and so if any teachers are interested, they can sign up right on our form, and we'll uh, be in touch with more information soon. And you can also check out the demos in our sandbox uh, as well. But if you're a developer who's really excited about AR and wants to work with us to build AR lessons, please express interest on our partner page. We've worked with so many different partners to build Expeditions VR, and we want to do the same with Expeditions AR. So definitely uh, sign up. And now I'd like to turn things over to Brandon, who's going to talk to you about building your own VR and AR experiences. Thanks, Jen. <clears throat> All right, so as, as Ben and Jen have really highlighted, we have seen huge success with Expeditions as an educational product through its use of VR to enable immersive learning. Additionally, our early efforts to bring AR to the classroom have shown a lot of promise. However, it isn't enough for us to be building these AR and VR products alone at Google. We really need developers to be focused on education as well to help grow the ecosystem. But, but why do I want this ecosystem to grow? Well, I think it's the right thing to do for the kids. I mean, as a father myself as, uh, of three young children, I want to see education transform to become uh, richer and more engaging for future generations. I, I mean, I've already started to notice that with my own children, I notice that they learn better if they can actually interact with something, whether it's my son building a leprechaun trap or my daughter crafting a tower with a 3D pen uh, or my youngest child chewing on a sock. Uh, maybe, maybe not so much the sock, but uh, <laughs> hopefully you see where I'm going. Uh, but it's important to note uh, that the like AR and VR educational experiences aren't just relevant inside of the classroom. There's actually also an enormous potential for their use in professional education as well. So I think this story is actually a really good example of this, and, I, and it's really interesting. So what this story is talking about, it's talking about how a utility company has started using an immersive group experience to give people exposure to what it might be like to work in a local sewer system. Uh, though after reading this, this is, this is actually one instance that I'm glad that we have not cracked virtual smells yet. All right, so what I want to do now uh, is to give you a really quick overview of some of the tools available that can allow you to build your own AR and VR experiences. So first off, I want to talk about Expeditions and its two fundamental features. First, Expeditions is immersive. We use 360 imagery to surround the students in the subject matter. Second, it provides a co-located guided experience that allows teachers to control and augment the experience as they deem appropriate. So first, let's talk about the easiest way to get 360 imagery into your own application that can be viewable in Cardboard or Daydream or even outside of a VR viewer. First, you need to start with something like the Ricoh Theta camera or Cardboard camera that works on Android and iOS to capture your imagery. Once you have your 360 content available, one of the easiest ways to actually make this, uh, make this viewable in your application is to use something called VRView. Now, VRView is a drop-in component for viewing 360 photos and video, 
And let me walk you through a quick sample on how to do this on Android, but be aware this is also available on iOS and the web as well. So step one is to add the VRView dependency to your Gradle build file if you're using Gradle. Next step is to actually add the VR panorama view to your layout. And then finally, you simply take your VR panorama view and you uh, use that to load and display your image. And almost like magic, it's now viewable in your application. Uh, and not only is it viewable in your application in VR, you can also view it in something that we call magic window mode that allows you just view it outside of a viewer and move your phone around. Now, I realize that I'm going over this very, very quickly, but I'm just trying to give everyone a, a quick overview of all these uh, tools. All right, so next up. But now, how can you enable a co-located guided experience? It's actually really straightforward with the nearby API. Let me quickly walk you through on how to do it on Android, but this is available on iOS as well. First step for adding the nearby API is just as with nearby, uh, just with VR view, is you add the dependency to uh, your Gradle build file. Then what you want to do is you want to create a message listener. And now this message listener is what you use to actually receive and process your messages. So you create your message listener. Create your message listener. And then once you have that listener, then you, you subscribe that against the nearby API. Pretty simple. Now, once you actually have your application that can listen to and receive and process your messages, then you can have your application actually publish these messages out to clients. Now, again, I went over this pretty quickly, but if you want to learn more about VRView or the nearby API, here are a couple of resources that you can check out. All right, so 360 photos are great. They are simple and easy to add to your app, but they're frankly pretty limiting because they restrict you to a certain type of content. As you start to prepare experiences, say for our upcoming standalone headset that we announced in the keynote yesterday, you're going to want something that's uh, more flexible and more powerful. So what are your options around building more advanced experience, uh, experiences without getting your hands dirty with OpenGL or similar? Enter WebVR. Google has been a strong force behind the WebVR standard. And today, it is fully supported in Chrome for Android, Firefox, Oculus, and Samsung browsers. That's all great, but what about building your own experiences that use web technologies? What I want to talk about is A-Frame. A-Frame is a web framework for building virtual reality experiences. Uh, now, this actually isn't a Google product, but I want to talk about it because it's one of the easiest ways that I've personally found to build VR experiences that target the web. So for instance, let's take a look at the 360 photo I showed you earlier uh, in the VR view example. And let's say we wanted to add a 2D image overlay on top of it. This is actually something that's pretty non-trivial to do with VR view. What you can see here in the sample, and this is actually a complete sample on how to do this, it's very easy to add our 360 photo and then our 2D image overlay and a very concise amount of HTML. And this should also look very syntactically familiar for those of you with web development experience. And then here is this example running in Chrome for Android. Amazing. All right, now I'm going to try to uh, talk about a slightly more complex example. Now, when I was in school, I struggled a lot with the concept of imaginary numbers. I mean, for one, the name is ridiculous, right? It's, they're imaginary numbers. They're not even real. Um, but besides the fact of, I think, the, the name choice of imaginary numbers as being really poor, I remember the concept to be really intimidating because it wasn't grounded in anything tangible. To help illustrate what I mean, let's take a look at this parabola, x squared plus 1. Now, the fundamental theorem of algebra actually states that there should be a value for x that causes this parabola to cross the x-axis. But we aren't seeing that here. So what are we missing? Well, the trick here is that there is a value for x that causes our parabola to cross the x-axis, but it requires us to use imaginary numbers. And one of the reasons this example of applying imaginary numbers seems so inaccessible is because educators have largely been limited to conveying information like this on a 2D plane, like a piece of paper. 
But just as we represent positive numbers on the number line in one direction and negative numbers in the other direction, we can actually think of imaginary numbers as just another dimension. When we represent our parabola in 3D space, our applied use of imaginary numbers seems a lot more obvious, right? You can clearly see that our parabola intersects with the x axis, right? It's obvious. Uh, well, actually, it's probably not obvious to you. And if you're feeling completely lost, great. That's my point. I'm trying to explain all of this using like, traditional 2D presentation tools. Now, imagine if you could enable students to explore concepts like imaginary numbers in VR. What's amazing here is that someone has actually already built a graphing calculator application called MathWorld VR using A-Frame. Also, not only is this tool available today, but it's completely open source. So if you want to take a look at a more advanced example of using A-Frame or targeting web VR, this is a great place to start. And if you want to learn more about A-Frame or MathWorld VR, you can check out these links. OK, so everything I've shown you up to this point has only enabled VR. And I haven't talked about AR at all. Google is pushing toward a web AR standard. But today, one of the best tools for building AR experiences, such as our Expeditions AR app that you can see in the sandbox next door, is, is with something called Unity. Now, if you've been building 3D games or VR content, it's very likely you've heard of Unity. Uh, now, if you're new to this space, there's a good chance maybe you aren't familiar with Unity or haven't heard of it at all, and that's, that's OK. Unity has been historically very popular for building mobile 3D games. But the same features that have empowered uh, developers to create amazing games actually also apply really well to AR and VR. So this is why we built Expeditions AR using Unity, because one, it provides really uh, robust support for importing and manipulating 3D objects. It provides a multiplayer API that works with peer-to-peer -peer connections, which is conducive to our traditional co-located uh, student-teacher classroom setup where an internet connection may be unavailable. And most importantly, it provides simple integration with Tango. And Tango is at the core of Google's AR tracking capabilities. Now, to provide slightly more depth on this topic, and if you've been paying attention, you might realize that's a pun, uh, though a bad one, let's talk about the three key features of Tango. So first, Tango provides uh, our position in 3D space. So we know where our device is looking and where it is located. And this is what allows students to walk around the room and see objects from different perspectives and distances. Uh, it also provides surface detection. It provides surface detection. Uh, so we know a floor is a floor and a desk is a desk. And this is what allows us to place objects relative to our physical space, uh, our physical space uh, and, and allow teachers to place objects on tables just as they would traditional um, uh, classroom materials. And then finally, Tango does all of this while giving us a global understanding of our position in space. So when we leave the classroom and come back, the objects remain. Now, if you want to learn more about Unity for Daydream or Cardboard or Tango integration, uh, you can check out these resources. I realize I went over this very fast. Um, but hopefully that gave you somewhat of a broad understanding of some of the tools available that will allow you to build your own AR and VR experiences. All right, let me hand you back to Ben. Thanks, Brandon. <clears throat> OK, so now, like, why are we so excited to have you guys build uh, AR and uh, VR learning experiences? And why do we think it's like almost an urgent thing? So um, sort of perfectly encapsulated in this quote from one of my heroes, Seymour Papert. Does anybody know Seymour Papert? We should all try harder uh, to learn like children is basically uh, the, the point here. Uh, and Papert is such an influence uh, for us, though, because he was one of the first people to see computers not as these like, things that have generally characterized people's understanding, these like, big information stores that are good at doing repetitive tasks and sort of like the logical extension of an encyclopedia. Um, but he saw them as these things that could be harnessed by people to create things, to learn by doing by making new things, by being able to sort of actively try and fail and try again. But here's like the great irony. In the last 30 or so years since like Papert began to compel us to rethink how to use uh, technology to support human learning, what we've actually seen is we've made much more progress teaching computers how to learn than we have with people. So I'll give you an example of this. People remember Deep Blue? Um, people remember Joel Benjamin. Does anyone remember Joel Benjamin? 
Joel Benjamin was the chess grandmaster that the Deep Blue team worked with at IBM to actually encode Deep Blue's game strategy. They basically extracted as many if-then statements as they could from like Joel Benjamin's mind, and they created this powerful com computer that could do what Joel Benjamin could do, just do it faster. And it was an amazing achievement for AI at the time. But then last year, just 22 years later, there was AlphaGo, the computer that defeated uh, one of the world's great Go players. But this wasn't done by encoding a computer with like, everything a human knows about the game's strategy. This was done by programming a computer to learn about how to learn about what a good Go strategy might be. So instead of like, one really smart Joel Benjamin, you basically have this like, ignorant crowd of really good learners who just play Go all the time. And to put that in some context, the difference between the number of moves in chess and the number of moves in Go is the difference between the number of atoms in your body and the number of atoms in the universe. And that's in like 20 years. So what happened that like, allowed for such dramatic progress in such a short time? Like, how is that milestone of, of like, uh, artificial intelligence that it was achieved just 20 years ago sort of cute in comparison to what we can do today? Well, it turns out that programming a computer to be smart is actually much harder than programming it to learn to be smart. Put another way, sort of artificial intelligence sort of grew into machine learning. So instead of like jamming computers full of if-then statements, we gave them the ability and some structure to observe success or progress, let them try and fail and try again. We gave them the same gift of learning that we're all born with as children, like the same gift that leads Brandon's youngest kid to eat his sock. So what do I take away from this? So much of traditional education and its accompanying technology tries to give that kids that like, old notion of artificial intelligence. Like, think about all the facts you were asked to memorize, all the standardized bubble tests you took, all the times the solution was presented to you as like choosing the right if-then statement. So if it took giving computers uh, the technology to experientially learn at scale to make them capable of tackling these cosmically hard problems like Go, then I think it should make us realize that the technology we need to be giving humans to help them learn needs to be focused on helping them learn by experiencing, by having agency, not just by giving them a bunch of facts. And that's like exactly why the emergence of, sort of widely available and powerful immersive computing like VR and AR is such an exciting opportunity. They can enable the right kind of learning moments at scale, provide people trying to learn something with experiences, with curiosity, with wonder, with like trial and error that can be arrived at quickly and, and safely. And they can inspire kids. And that's like a much more powerful force than any educational technology that we could actually create. So if we, and that, that concludes all of you, uh, if we get this right, we have a chance to give the same gift that we spent the last 20 years giving to like rack-mounted servers uh, to our own students. Uh, so that's why we're really excited to see what we all do. So thanks very much.